After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Paul Milstein Hall at Cornell University. Milstein's superstructure consists primarily of a large floor plate raised above the ground on a grid of columns. It cantilevers in two directions, over University Avenue on the north side and around Sibley Hall on the south side. To understand how these rather dramatic cantilevers are supported, let's examine the second floor framing plan. First, a grid of columns is deployed evenly over the site. Then, four full-story high trusses, two at each end of the building, project over University Avenue. The east trusses also cantilever in the opposite direction, towards the Arts Quad. Actually, these are not true trusses, nor are they orthogonal rigid frames, so-called Verendale trusses, like, for example, the multi-story rigid frames of Eurus Hall at Cornell. Instead, they are rigid frames, but with some inclined elements to reduce bending stresses where they would otherwise be inordinately high. Another truss is fastened to the ends of these four cantilever trusses, providing support for two lines of interior girders. With these six lines of structure, a regular pattern of floor and roof beams can complete the framing. It's interesting to compare the pattern of Milstein's beams, girders, and columns to those in Rand Hall. The hierarchical arrangement is identical. What differs dramatically are the spans. As the strength of steel has increased since 1917, when Rand Hall was built, the 15-foot spans typical in those days have more than doubled. What is at first puzzling is how lateral forces, those forces due to wind or earthquake, are resisted, since there are no shear walls or diagonal braces anywhere on the first level that might be expected to serve that function. There is only one possible explanation. Rigid connections capable of resisting bending moments must be created where the columns intersect the trusses or girders. Here we see a detail of a typical rigid connection, showing the bottom of the truss, the first floor column flanges, stiffener plates matching the column flanges that are welded into the bottom truss cord, and finally the flanges of the bottom cord itself. Buildings are built from the bottom up. The first elements of the superstructure are the column base plates that are bolted to concrete piers that rise up from caisson caps cast on the ground. These base plates are in two pieces. The first piece is carefully leveled and then grouted so that any loads placed on it are transferred directly to the concrete pier. The second piece is actually welded to the column itself and made more rigid with 4-inch high stiffener plates. The first columns, girders, and beams are erected at the center of the building. Little by little, the frame is extended further toward the site boundaries. At this point, the first truss segments are trucked to the site. They are then slowly lifted in place, segment by segment. That cable, that strapping, is this, it's all Kevlar. There's no metal in it. On the right, getting in there. Due to the weight of these truss segments, a large capacity 650 ton hydraulic crane is used. And then they have the second crane getting ready to start putting in the intermediate pieces to hold that truss on. So they kind of got to work it together. And then once both the cranes will be holding, the, the big crane will hold the truss in place until they can set all the steel, make the welds and bolt, and then they can relieve them. So that's probably Beams are lifted into place and bolted to the elements that define the primary lines of structure, either the truss cords themselves or interior girders. One truss segment immediately adjacent to Rand Hall has to be taken down and slightly modified so that it will fit properly. Some of the cornice on Rand Hall is also removed and the truss segment is then secured in place. Hey. More beams are bolted into place between the trusses. The truss segments that cantilever out beyond the main structure present special difficulties. 
since the cords of the truss have not yet been welded to the truss segments already in place, the ends of the cantilevers must be temporarily supported on scaffolding. Steel workers lift the first cantilevered section a bit too early in the morning for this videographer. All right, so it's eight in the morning, but they beat me to it. They've got that cantilevered section in place. Let's take a look. Hey, Bill, beat me to it. I've been here, dude. I know. Seven, 7.40. I decided to have breakfast instead. Yeah. The next cantilevered section is lifted in place a bit later in the day. Members of the architecture faculty watch this unique and acrobatic exercise. Any comments for the record? <laughs> cool. cool. How about you? What's the question? Comments for the record in this historic Thank moment. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, guys are so nimble. Wow, yeah. amazing. And fearless. And very fearless. Or maybe reckless is the word. Shaped and still nimble. <laughs> <laughs> A similar process extends the cantilever trusses over University Avenue. Once all the trusses, girders, and beams are in place, corrugated metal decking spanning between the beams is fastened with small plug welds. A steel angle at the outer edges completes this portion of the construction. One unusual feature of the second floor is this diagonal seating area, which also covers the auditorium seating directly below it. On the roof, openings are created for skylights. All of the joints between the truss segments, as well as the rigid joints between columns and girders, or columns and trusses, are welded on site, with flange thicknesses of as much as four inches, as can be seen at the end of this truss segment. These are extraordinarily large welds. Some of them take over 24 hours to complete. The process is time-consuming, as each line of weld must be carefully ground down before a new line is made. The process repeats over and over again until the full penetration is achieved. In a traditional topping out celebration, possibly deriving from Scandinavia, a small fir tree is attached to the last of the main steel elements of Milstein Hall. The flag is of more recent origin. But the steel work isn't quite finished. The final element is a freestanding steel stair structure on the west side of Milstein Hall. These images, taken by Bill Staffeld, show how the stair structure was brought to the site in pieces, which were then welded together. I did finally get to take a closer look at it myself. So we're walking to the new stair. We'll get up to the other floor levels that way. Galvanized rock risers. Entrance to the stair, and then looking back down the stair. Let's end this installment with a view through the structure of the welded stair tower, still without its final covering, and with blue skies, typical of Ithaca weather, providing an appropriate backdrop. 